Hi, my name is Dylan Bolisky. I work for Wolfram in the distributed systems department, mostly on projects like the cloud. Uh, today, my talk is on building automated analytics platforms using Wolfram technology, specifically focusing on automation and ingestion, visualization, and distribution of analytics. I'm Dylan Bolisky. I'm a software engineer in Wolfram's distributed systems engineering department, uh, mostly working products like cloud and private cloud. Um, as well as doing a few other things. And I'm here today to talk about design and implementation of an automated analysis and reporting system, which is hopefully a very long title for something that's relatively simple and straightforward to do. So what I'm here to talk about today is kind of the automation aspect of data science. So for the most part, a lot of talks that I see either talk about trying to ingest the raw data and import it and maybe do some cleaning, or it's on the other end where it's, okay, you have data in like a data set and you just want to do visualizations and make a pretty one-off report. But a lot of times in real life, you're going to be doing that same process over and over and over again every day, every week, every month. Um, and it'd be nice to be able to build an automated way of just having a system that goes out, gathers the data that you need, does all the cleaning, the pre-processing that you need to, stores that somewhere, does any analysis that you need, generates the visualizations, and then distributes it to whoever or, well, whoever or wherever it needs to be viewed. So I'm gonna be talking about building one of those systems, like one I built for Wolfram's in-house public relations department, which handled going out, gathering media mentions for terms like Mathematica and Wolfram language, Storing all that, doing analysis, things like sentiment analysis, geolocation analysis, time series stuff, and building reports for the PR department to actually be able to get a better idea on where we're being talked about without having to manually go out on the web and read every news article. So that line is going to be something like this. I'm going to talk about the design for the system itself. Um, since most of the tasks, well, all the tasks are automated, I'm going to talk about the structure that I use for designing those tasks specifically, and then go into a little bit of detail on the PR department specific application and how its data collection works, how the cleaning and processing task works, some data visualization and statistics examples, and then how to actually build those into reports, dashboards, and publish and share all that data. So the system itself is relatively small and straightforward. So I have a few different tasks. There's a data collection task. This one actually goes out, calls the APIs that provide the raw data from web crawling, imports it in, does some minimal cleaning on it, mostly trimming out fields that I know we don't need for analysis or that are just excessive, handles any missing data at that point, and then stores it in an MX file. The next task is the cleaning and pre-processing stage. Um, this one will actually read in that raw data, handles actually computing things, so taking strings, converting them to data objects, taking raw text, doing sentiment analysis on it, actually doing kind of the heavy lifting for getting ready to generate visualizations. And again, it then once it's finished with all that analysis, dumps out the data in a nice data set to an MX file to, again, be read in later. The stage after that is the visualization and presentation phase. So this is where the actual individual graphics will be generated. So things like date histograms or geobubble charts or just general histograms or any kind of table showing raw data in a little bit nicer and more consumable format. So things like this is the title of the article, here's a link, here's a quick emoji that shows what the sentiment was for it. So at a glance, someone that doesn't know anything about computer science, could still look at it and understand what's going on. And then the final stage is taking all those visualizations, pulling them together, generating a single unified report that can then either be hosted on the web or emailed out to individual well, employees that need to see it. Or again, it, this stage is the more custom stage because it's the how do you actually want your results to be consumed. But I'll go through a few different scenarios and how to handle that. So as far as the task design goes, I'm using scheduled tasks deployed on the Wolfram Public Cloud in this case. Um, I try to make the tasks relatively small themselves. So generally, any code I need, I factor out into a single Wolfram language package, deploy that to the cloud, and then my task will get that package, call some function from it, 
pass in any configuration files that might specify things like what term was searched for or what specific type of analysis needs to be done. You give that task a schedule. On the public cloud, tasks are limited to run once per hour. So in this case, I'm specifying hourly. And then finally, I set the notification function option to the list of admins on the system. The idea here being, if this task fails for some reason, maybe the internet goes down on whatever node this is running or something else goes wrong, only the people that actually could fix the problem get notified rather than anyone that consumes the report or the one employee that set this up 10 years ago but has since left the company. This way, people can more easily get access to it. Now, there's a few different reasons why I break the task down into a package with a small amount of task code here as well as a different object for a list of admins. Um, mostly, this comes down to redeploying the task. So if you embed all your code inside the task, then anytime you need to make a change, whether that's adding a new field to be analyzed or trying to adjust, I don't know, plot themes on a specific visualization, you'd have to redeploy the entire task. This way, you only have to redeploy the package if the code changes. If you wanted to change the schedule, then all you need to do is change the schedule for the task. If you want to change the list of admins, you only have to update the admin object. It's kind of segmenting the code to avoid, well, if you, say, wanted to change just the list of admins, having to remember the full code for the schedule task or where that code lives to redeploy it. Now, actually getting into some data science-y stuff. So for the PR department platform I built, we use a third-party API system called Webhose that goes out and actually crawls the internet for all the data. Uh, given that today is Halloween, I thought my live data example would be searching for all articles on the internet containing the word Halloween. Um, I'm limiting it to only websites ranked under 5,000. This will thin down the amount of data I get so that hopefully the computer doesn't blow up while I run it do the basic pre-processing and produce a decent data set by the end. So yeah, you get a data set that looks something like this. This is kind of what the raw data looks like. So it's not thinned down at all. None of the data has been interpre interpreted to any kind of extent. Uh, you can kind of see raw URLs everywhere. You see really ugly UUIDs to identify articles. This is that kind of first step. The reason why I break up this step from the pre-processing step is with a lot of APIs, especially ones that crawl the web looking for articles that could conceivably be in a lot of different languages, things can go wrong when trying to do that interpretation. Maybe I get something that has, I don't know, emojis in it, and I didn't account for that when trying to do my sentiment analysis. I want to preserve that raw data for future analysis and details later. So get the raw data, save that, Worst case, I end up deleting it. Best case, maybe I can reuse that for some more advanced analysis later on. As I said, next is the cleaning and processing stage. So this is where I go through and start actually dealing with the data. First, filter it down to just the fields that I care about. In this case, it's dealing with things like the title for the article, what site category it was listed under, so discussion, blog, news, country codes, their built-in spam score, and performance score, some social analysis, so where things were liked and shared. Nothing too crazy. Next, I build a bunch of interpreters to interpret into the final fields I want. So timestamp does some work converting things into data objects properly, taking into account time zones. Um, things like text, I don't want to un-icon this because it's a massive function that deals with trying to determine the sentiment, assuming that the language for the text is actually English and our built-in classifier can handle it well and also looking for emojis because that might weight things in different directions. The country handles converting things to actual geo entities based off of what they were listed as, which seemed straightforward until I realized they didn't list European countries all the time. Sometimes they only listed EU, so being able to deal with both those cases. And then some of the things like scores, it also does some more classifiers and more analysis. So initialize those functions. And then finally, this also sorts the articles by the timestamp so that everything's already sorted and pretty once it gets to that step. And now it's going to take time because it has to contact Wolfram servers. At this stage, does anyone have any questions about things covered? Yeah? Why don't you use the built-in interpreters? Is that For the most part, a lot of times I am using the built-in interpreters. Um, 
sometimes I want to do something a little bit more specific to my own application, in which case I might change it. So for like data object, because the interpreter has to deal with ambiguity, a lot of times we're dealing with like, did they put it year, month, day, or year, year, day, month. Since I know that it's a consistent format, I can skip that step and just say, this is the format, this is how you read it in and parse the string. Um, for a lot of things like language, yeah, it detects English correctly because it just says English and handles it perfectly well. Um, so some of these functions really are short, so let's open the language one. So yeah, the language interpreter, if it lets me scroll to the right. Nope. Well, if it let you scroll to the right, all it says is interpreter of language of the specific column that contains it. So it's a bit of a mix of both. It, and it really depends on the specific applications on which ones I intend to use. So once you actually have all that data analyzed and in the format that you really want it in, now you can actually have fun and generate visualizations for that. So at this stage, it's kind of dealing with writing the actual visualizations you may want or that you think you might want, playing around with things, and coming up with the exact code that generates those. In this case, I was going to do a date histogram, but it looks like the kernel's crashed. So we'll just keep going. But the idea would be it shows the data bin by 10 minute slots for all articles in the past, it was 95 elements, so probably about past six hours of data. Once you actually have those visualization tasks up and running, you have to decide on how you actually want to have the analysis consumed. Sometimes it might just be you already have a dashboard web page up and running that shows a bunch of analysis and you want to augment that to show more information. In that case, just having a task that exports all that data to a PNG file, so you have a nice visualization to look at. It could also be something where, because of your system, the data is going to be updating fairly regularly. Instead, in a scheduled task, you can use a delayed object and, again, have it be referenced as a PNG, even cache it if you want. Um, and we'll see an example of that later. Um, if, on the other hand, maybe it's you're trying to replace a report that you want to, that you have to send out every single day showing, I don't know, mentions of your company on Twitter or something along those lines. You can use what's called a document generator, which is a subtype of schedule task. Um, schedule tasks are just execute this code on this schedule. What document generators do is they take a template notebook and potentially driver details for that notebook and regenerate, well, basically called generate document on that template on that schedule. So if you wanted to say, have a full notebook with interactivity that's just being regenerated every hour on the cloud, you can easily deploy it using a document generator. Um, additionally, there are options like delivery function, which allow you to send that report as an attachment to an email to whatever users you want. And you can also specify down to, okay, for these five users, send it as a notebook because they have Mathematica. For these 15 users, send it as a PDF because they don't need interactivity and then maybe they don't have a site license. Or you could send it just as, well, a PDF to whoever you want, really. It can also just be a raw function. So if you want to, if the output shows this, send it to these people. If it shows something else, don't send it to them because it's probably wrong and send it to a third party. And then notification function for document generators behaves the same as it does for scheduled tasks, basically. Say who you want to be notified when it fails, who you want to be notified when it succeeds, if anyone, or who do you want to notify just that it ran successfully or not. And again, it can also be a raw function, so you can get kind of creative with how that exactly works. The other example that I was talking about was using a delayed. Um, in this case, the idea is I want to have a web page that contains maybe some more HTML-based things, so not just images, but maybe it generates a table, maybe it generates I don't know, a series of buttons or links that you can click, but you have an XML template or an HTML template that you can use XML template to apply. And again, whatever template code you want, you put in here. Whatever computer values you want to pass in, whether those are actually raw data or links to the cloud objects that contain the images, you can put, provide as the second argument as an association. Next, you specify that you want it to be HTML. If you know that that's only going to be updated every hour, you can add the cache persistence option and specify that you want a cache to stick around for an hour. What this means is rather than wasting computational time regenerating these images every single hour when no one's looking at them, so 
overnight, uh, you can use a delayed where it will only update if the cache is over this cache persistence value. So if it's 1 in the afternoon and someone looks at it and someone looks at it again at 1.10, it's still going to be the same cache. But if someone looks at it at 5 p.m. and then the next person doesn't look at it until 8 a.m., there was no recomputed data in between. It just stayed quiet. It doesn't recompute until the person at 8 a.m. actually decides to look at it. Um, one thing to note at this stage is because it is only recomputing on demand when the cache expires, it's not cached when it needs to be regenerated. Um, so it will be slightly slower because it has to recompute everything. Um, so if you say, know that at 10 AM you're going to have a meeting with the CEO and he's going to be upset if the network seems really slow because it has to recompute 1,000 images, maybe have a scheduled task or something that calls that URL and generates the cache for you right before the meeting. Um, I don't want to say I know that from experience, but I know that from experience. <laughs> Additionally, if you do want to have that kind of full interactivity experience that you would get with a notebook, but maybe you want it kind of inside of another website or another dashboard that you already have, um, as Stephen mentioned during his keynote address and as a few other developers have talked about during their talks, there is the Wolfram Notebook Embedder Library. So you can still have your report generated as an actual notebook on the cloud and then just embed it in whatever website or dashboard you're currently using. Lastly, there is a QR code that if you want to scan on this page to see an example of a delayed notebook that's using some actual generated data that I did earlier today, feel free to scan it at this point. It's all hosted on our public cloud and should be public to everyone. So if you have trouble seeing it, let me know and I can quickly get on our cloud and change things. Yes, the notebook's on Pathable, and then there's a link on the very last slide to a full GitHub repository that includes both this notebook as well as all the code that I used for the media monitoring system that I built for Wolfram. So if you feel like monitoring your own media mentions, feel free. So the kind of last and biggest kind of discussion point is publishing and sharing of all this. We've talked about distributing it through either emails or having web pages up there, but we haven't talked about kind of gatekeeping on those web pages at all. Um, so there's a few different systems within Wolfram's cloud to handle permissions. Um, if you, say, have a group of users, so like a team that you always want to be able to view a specific report or even edit it, you can use permissions groups to set up that group of users and be able to handle emailing all reports to that group or just giving them permissions to be able to view a specific object. Additionally, there's a function called permissions key, which I guess the closest analogy would be it's a password protection on a specific document. So if you say only want people that you've given the password to to be able to view it, but you're kind of happy to give that password out to anyone that needs to, permissions key work. Personally, for reports, I prefer groups over keys just because groups change and I don't feel like trying to have to look up a password to send out to different people. Um, beyond both of those, if you kind of don't care who sees it or you want everyone to see it, you can also just use the cloud publish function to make any reports public for everyone. So that's kind of what I did with the previous example notebook. It's public, so any of you can view it. I don't have to deal with keeping track of users. I don't even have to keep track of whether or not the user is authenticated. I get charged the cloud credits for it. Anyone can see it. And then if you want to dive deeper into the permission system and have more finicky settings um, on who can view, edit, or do anything with a given system. There's always the set permissions option for a given cloud object. So if, say, you have a report that runs every week, it's only kind of viewable to your group, but maybe it's towards the end of the year, it's a really big report, it shows that you guys have been doing great, and you want to share that with the CEO, you can modify the permissions on that given instance. So they can see that one, but not have any clue that all the other ones have been existing. So. As I said, the last slide, QR code to the GitHub repository where all of this is listed. Um, there's also, as Stephen pointed out during his keynote, a badge for the repository. Um, since there's only one notebook, which is this presentation in that repository at the moment, it will automatically open that this slideshow on the Wolfram Cloud so you guys can view it and scroll through and hopefully reevaluate my code and have it work instead of have the computer crash. But yeah. So um, any questions?